Good morning. What a beautiful day, isn't it? So glad you're including us in it. Just before we get started this morning, I wanted to make you aware we actually have an opportunity to serve uh, on our facilities team as a facilities attendant. It's a part-time position. And if you enjoy being part of a great team, it might be something you want to consider. Uh, it includes, uh, obviously, some cleaning responsibilities and setup and reset after ministry um, events here. And so if that's something you're interested in, you can go online to the letter R, which stands for rochestercalvary.org. So rcalvary.org forward slash jobs. Or you can stop by the Welcome Center on the way out, and they'll have some information for you as well. Uh, we're starting a new series this morning on worship, worship. And I'd like to start with a really odd and quite honestly tragic story that comes from the Old Testament. You can find it in 1 Samuel chapter 4. We're not going to turn there right now, but 1 Samuel chapter 4 tells a story of the Israelites. They're living in the promised land, but things have been challenging. There's another group of people, another nation called Philistine, and they have been more or less dominating them. There's been a lot of injustice. They work hard to grow crops, and then they're stolen away from them. There's, uh, the, the Philistines had really uh, an advantage in military technology, and so they used that. And so as a result, uh, one day the, the Philistines determined that they were going to engage in a military strike against Israel, kind of teach them a lesson. And Israel on this particular day decided that they would fight back. They weren't just going to take it anymore. So they went out and they met in battle, and it did not go well. In fact, by the time the day was over, 4,000 Israelite soldiers had been slain on the field of battle. Everyone else just kind of retreated back to their tent that night. They were angry, they were confused, they were afraid, and they weren't sure how to process what had just happened to them. And so someone, we don't know who, but someone had an idea. And the idea was, let's get the Ark of the Covenant and let's take it with us into battle. If you don't know what the Ark of the Covenant was, it was a box that was made out of wood that was overlaid with gold. It contained the Ten Commandments that Moses had given to the nation of Israel. And it also contained Aaron's rod. Aaron was one of the leaders. And uh, he had a staff, and, and that was included in there. And there was a jar of manna that had been preserved from when God had provided for them in the wilderness. And so this was the Ark. And that Ark of the Covenant, if you ever saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, that, that's the kind of renown that thing had. Pe people didn't touch it. They didn't look at it. They, so they decided, we're going to take it into battle. The high priest's name was Eli, and he had two sons. There will not be a test on this. Their names are Hophni and Phinehas. And uh, not a lot of Hophni's and Phineas's uh, left anymore. But they, they were responsible for the transportation of the ark. And when they brought the ark into the camp, getting ready for a battle, it was like the Bills won the Super Bowl. I mean, people stood and cheered and stumped so much that the Bible says the ground actually shook. So here's a question. What they were doing right then, was that worship? Actually, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to me all the time, so. That's right. If you become an expert at apologizing and changing your mind, you can become a pastor. That's, that's what's true. So, so, uh, they weren't focused on God. They were focused on what they wanted, which, by the way, was a good thing. They wanted to beat an enemy that was taking advantage of them. But what they wanted to do was to use God's power to get what they really wanted. And that's a little bit of a problem. By the way, it, they went out to battle very confidently, very boldly. By the way, when all the Philistines heard that noise, they got very anxious. In fact, the Bible says this is what they thought. If, if that ark comes in and they defeat us, they will do to us what we have been doing to them. And that was unacceptable. So it was do or die. It was we're either going to win this or we're going to die because that's not going to happen. And that battle did not go well for Israel. The 
first battle, they lost 4,000 men. This battle, they lost 30,000 soldiers in a single day. On top of that, the sons of the high priests were killed in that battle. On top of that, the Ark of the Covenant was actually captured by the enemy. The news came back to the town, and uh, the high priest, his name was Eli. At this point in his life, he's 98 years old, and he's blind, and he's morbidly obese. It's amazing how just unbelievably straightforward Scripture is in describing what real life looks like. And when he heard the news, he was so shaken that he fell over, he fell backwards, and he broke his neck and he died. I know you're thinking, this is not a good story, and it's not. It's not a good story. And you're asking, why are we talking about it? And, and I do have a reason. Just hang on. It gets worse before it gets better. Um, Eli's son, who was killed in battle, uh, that son had a wife, and she was pregnant, and near the time of delivery. And the news that her husband was dead, and her father-in-law was dead, and the Ark of the Covenant was captured was so overwhelmingly stressful to her that her body just went into labor. And she gave birth to a healthy boy, but there were complications in the delivery, and she did not survive the delivery. She knew she was dying, and they asked her, what shall we name this child? And she said, uh, we will name this child Ichabod. And this is what the word means. The glory is gone. It's gone. So when we think about that word glory, what does that mean to us? For lots of us, it means a time in our life when we did something that mattered and others noticed. We refer to those as our glory days. I think Springsteen actually did a song about that. If you've ever talked to anyone who a few decades ago had that winning pass, made that winning basket, made that game-saving tackle, kicked that winning field goal, whatever it was that they did, they will recall and retell that story over and over and over again. Anytime there's a group that will sit and listen. And what, why do they refer to that so much? Because they did something that mattered and everybody knows it's kind of their reputation. Is that all glory is? It's just a reputation. There's another way we tend to use glory, and it has to do with the idea of, of our, our appearance, how we look. If we look impressive. And uh, you, you might have heard the phrase, uh, they showed up in all their glory. And that just means that they looked as good as they can look. Like that happens a lot with brides and grooms on wedding days. That's as good as it gets. That's why they take pictures. <laughs> it is, because it's never going to be better than that. It's just, so is, is, that, is that what glory is? Just a reputation of something you used to do or how you look? And when you look at the passage of Scripture we're going to look at today, it begins to reveal something about what God's glory is and what God's glory does. It is actually very surprising to us. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. <laughs> Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate, that word can also be translated reflect, we, we focus on and reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, 
which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Hebrew word for glory might surprise you. It actually is the word for weight. That glory has a real weight about it. They're trying to signify something of substance and something that matters. When our kids were little, we would have these little plastic key rings that we would give to them to play with. And so they were a bit oversized and brightly colored and, and, uh, and, and light. Uh, when you're packing uh, supplies for children, the parents' goal is to uh, pack as little and as light as possible. And so, but they never liked the little plastic rings. They always wanted the real ones. If you ever put both out, they always took the real keys over the fake ones every time. And one of the reasons is you could just tell these were real because they weighed more. It's kind of this weight about it. See, God's glory is not just some kind of weightless, ethereal vapor that, that, that wafts in and out of the imaginations of religiously focused people. We, this is something that we struggle with because our assumption can very easily be that the only things that are real are the things that we can see. And that's a presumption that can harm us a lot. If you uh, serve in the military and you're involved in military exercises, they've got this wonderful little piece of technology called night vision goggles. And what they do is they help you to see in the dark. Now, I suppose there might be a soldier that would say, if I can't see that enemy combatant in the dark with my eyes, I don't believe they're there. That is not a good strategy. They're there. And the technology enables you to see what your eyes don't, the natural spectrum of the human eye doesn't pick up on. We've got space telescopes that can identify bandwidths of light that we're incapable of registering on our, on our retina. And they've discovered the most astonishing and breathtaking and beautiful things in the heavens. It's unbelievable how good. We should not start with the presumption the only thing that's real is what I can see with my own eyes. The glory of God is not visible to the natural eye, but it is substantive. It is real, and it has real weight to it. This is a really interesting concept. So Moses was, in this passage, it tells us Moses had spent time with God. Not just thinking about God. He spent time with God. That's how he got those Ten Commandments. When he came down the mountain, the Bible tells us that his face actually shone. I don't know exactly what that means, but I do know that over time, whatever that was began to fade. And Moses became a little self-conscious about that. And so Moses put a veil over his face so that other people would not see this fading reality of when he had spent time with God. Now, I know in lots of cultures in the world, there's a lot more veil wearing than what we see. In, in, in the United States, usually it's just on wedding days and not even so much that anymore. Uh, but the idea of wearing veils, but almost always it's been limited to females. And can you imagine Moses showing up wearing a veil? What would you think if I walked into church this morning as a pastor wearing a veil? You, you would think I was a bandit here to do something bad. You know, are you trying to hold us up? What's going on? And that's, here's what I want you to hear. Veils are baked into the old covenantal system. Whether they were suspended from the ceiling that would hinder access and sight lines to the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence, or whether it was a veil over a face, or it even said, there are veils over our heart. That's a really big deal. So here's the first thing I want you to see this morning is that God's glory removes veils. God's glory removes veils. Veils keep us from seeing everything that could be seen or from being seen. And the Bible tells us that the closer we get to God, those things begin to be removed. Now, some of us don't want to see the truth about ourselves. If you've ever had a friend who came and, in confidence, challenged you about something because of something they noticed about you, it is so hard not to get defensive in those moments. And usually what we'll say is, well, you're, you're misinterpreting that. That's not the real me. Okay, here's the question. Why can't people see the real you? 
Why can't you show the real you? And the answer is, is because there's a veil. We don't want people to see everything that there is about us. And we don't want to see everything there is about others. So we put this veil over our lives. When veils are taken away, we not only see ourselves more clearly, we see God more clearly too. And this surprises us. It's very different than we imagine God to be. Uh, in my line of work, you would be surprised how many people come to me to tell me what God is really like. I was in a business one day visiting someone, and, th and they knew I was a pastor. I'd been introduced. So they were going to preempt any effort that I would have to, to influence their, their train of thought. And they just began to tell me all the things that they believed God was and God was not, that God would do and that God wouldn't do. And it, they went on for a few minutes. And so when they were all done, I just looked at them, and I said, that's a very interesting view of God. Where did you get it? What is your resource for knowing that's true about God? And here's what we need to know. People's imaginations and opinions have been trying to make gods or recreate the living God for all of human history. And you should know our imaginations and our opinions are no match for the weight of the glory of God. We need to see him for who he really is. And when we do, it's stunning. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, the first chapter, that when we see Jesus, we see the exact representation of God. It is astonishing how many people have ideas and opinions about God. And they will promote them, often to get something they want or to avoid something that they don't want. And God doesn't allow that. And what we see is that Jesus refuses to initiate another religion of veils. He won't do it. Veils are not an option. In fact, even he is stripped naked and nailed to a cross and crucified. And what we see is unbelievable. It's the one true God. And we see him for who he really is. The Bible says this in John, the first chapter, right? I'm not there yet. Okay, jump ahead. John, the first chapter, it says that he, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. His glory. We see God for who he actually is in Jesus Christ. So God's glory removes veils. God's glory also increases freedom. God's glory increases freedom. I wish I could tell you that, that we can do anything we want. And I know people say that. And, and people even say this. I live in a free country. I can do whatever I want. Can you? Because I think there are a lot of things that we would like to do that we're afraid to try. I think there are things, new things that we would like to try, but we're afraid we'll fail. There are times we want to be generous, but we're afraid we won't have enough. There are times when we want to make a difference, but we're worried we'll waste our time and our energy. There are times when we want to declare or express our love, but we are afraid of rejection. There are times when we want to tell our faith story to someone else, but we are afraid they will consider us goofy or intellectually deficient. And we don't act. Is that freedom? That the things that we're afraid might happen actually have a greater capacity to define who we are and determine what we do? That's not freedom. When we approach God, not only does he begin to remove veils, but he begins to give real options and the kind of faith that enables us to step into them. Real freedom. Lastly, God's glory transforms. We are being transformed by his glory. That's what the passage said. God actually invites us to draw near to him, and he welcomes us when we show up. The distance between people and God has always been determined by people, not by God. 
People, the first human beings that failed, the first thing they did, they started to veil their own bodies and cover up. They started to veil and cover up their own failure, and they began to blame other people. And when they heard God's voice, they ran in the other direction, and they hid behind trees. People have been veiling themselves and blaming others and shaming others ever since. And it's God who's always pursuing us. He's the one who pursues us in the person of his son, Jesus. And his son, Jesus, not only came to us, he gave his life for us. And that's where that passage is. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his, what's the next word? Glory. And everyone who experiences that glory, their lives are, are transformed. And when we see him, we see that he is both grace and truth. We always think that those commodities can't coexist peacefully. That if you're truthful, you can't be gracious. And if you're gracious, you can't be truthful. But in Jesus, we see they are not incompatible at all. They're perfectly married together. So we are not transformed by trying to be like God. We are transformed by drawing near to God. Being like God was the original temptation. If you try to be like God, you will go places that you wish you hadn't gone and do things that you wish you hadn't done. But if you draw near to God, veils begin to be taken away. Freedom begins to be released. And the weight of his glory begins to shape our lives instead of just being shaped by the things we're afraid of or the frustrations we've experienced, or the failures from our past, that the weight of God's glory has a greater shaping capacity than any of those things. So we're just invited to draw near to God, and that's actually what is at the heart of worship. It's acknowledging what is true about God, not just trying to get something from him. That we don't just want something and use God to get it. We want God. That's a really big deal. Now, this is what I believe. When we begin to see God, we actually begin to speak something. The more we see, the more we'll say. Uh, this is an uncomfortable story for me to tell, but I did it, so I guess I have to own it. When, when I was a much younger man and living at home with my family, um, uh, my sister, I was the oldest of five, my sister had a boyfriend. I didn't particularly like this guy. And so one day he came to the door, it was a screen door, and the, the screen was open, and he could see me sitting in the living room, and I could see him, and he knocked on the door, and I completely ignored him. <laughs> so he knocked again, and I didn't say anything, I didn't, I didn't do anything, I just sat there and looked at the TV. And so he just kept knocking until my sister walked into the living room, and she says, what are you doing? Why didn't you let him in? I said, he's not my boyfriend. It's... We would, you know, when I tell that story, you laugh, but if you were the boyfriend, you wouldn't like me very much. Can you imagine someone coming into your house, not saying a word, and standing silently in the back of the room? We would think that strange behavior indeed. We would wonder what their intent was, and we would worry they're, they're stalkers. And God hasn't called us to be stalkers, to, to come into the place where worship is being lifted and just hide. The veils get torn apart. And, and we say something. We do this all the time. When someone comes in, we, we, we say something to them. Good morning. Welcome. How are you doing? And we, we respond. Even guys, guys who don't, sometimes they don't even know each other. I don't know if you've noticed, there's something called a guy nod. Have you noticed? Like two guys walking down the street, and they'll just go. <laughs> and, and there actually is two nods. One is an up nod, and one is a down nod. And I'm not going to tell you the difference. <laughs> and now you're going to worry. Which one are you getting and why? And we come into a place like this, and this is what people will say as we're, as we're approaching worshiping God. I'm just going to ask the worship team to come up. We're approaching God in worship, and we just go, well, I'm not really, I'm not like that. I'm not an outgoing person. I, I don't, you know, I'm here. And it's good to be here. 
But as you begin to see something that's true about God, don't you want to say it? Well, Pastor, I, I don't have a good voice. Maybe you don't. Maybe your voice is horrible. Not a lot of actual horrible voices. But I've never seen a parent who, when they heard the sound of their child's voice, looked at the child and said, I can't stand the sound of your voice. Would you please be quiet? And your Heavenly Father, regardless of your opinion of your voice, his eyes light up and his face breaks open in a wide smile every time you say something to him. You will not find the exception to that. So we come into a room like this, and a lot of us have fails. And I, I'm not that kind of personality. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't say things out loud. I, I don't respond. I'm, I'm just here to listen. Your life won't be transformed by listening. I wish it would. It'd make my job easier. We're transformed by the glory of God. Veils begin to come off and freedom begins to be released. And the weight of his glory, well, it begins to shape our lives in ways that are unbelievable in terms of redemptive potential. That half of what you believed, if not more, about yourself is not true. That what God sees in you is greater than you've ever seen in yourself. And our veils are keeping us from it. And our freedom is inhibiting our capacity to walk in it. And so this morning, in just a minute, we're all going to stand and we're going to lift our voice. And, and I know some of you are going, I don't know. Well, all right, let's start with, when we, it's time to stand, at least stand. All right. Uh, secondly, try singing. Oh, I'm not, I can't do that. Then lip sync. <laughs> at least move your lips. Do something. All right. And, and maybe you'll want to raise your hands. Oh, I don't raise my hands. Start low and slow. Just do this. <laughs> Some of you worship animals will be, you know, just arms high, hard to be in them. And this is what I will tell you. When you come into the presence of God, you let those veils begin to slide away and you let freedom begin to be infused into your being, his glory begins to transform you and you will leave different than you came in. Not because you heard a message, but because you're in the presence of God. Would you stand with me? And let's lift our voice this morning. Let's worship him.